At the very heart of the Imperium of Man, within even the sacred confines of the soul system, we would invariably be blinded by Terra's holy light. But to look outwards, past its orbit, we would find the greatest of forge worlds to be found throughout the galaxy. And this technocratic bastion would be known as Mars. The Red Planet is to be considered as the central burning forge to the often mysterious group known as the Adeptus Mechanicus, who have eschewed from the worship of the Emperor, as instead they will venerate the immortal machine god, who supposedly gave rise to each and every technological artifact across the galaxy. Whilst many would believe that this puts them at odds with the wider Imperium, in actuality, mankind and the cult of Mars coexist within a peaceful and mutually beneficial state. The secret techniques behind constructing the many civilian appliances and military arms used throughout the Imperium are known only to the tech priests themselves, and so their existence has been tolerated as a matter of pragmatic necessity. The scions of the Mechanicus, however, will not willingly share these schematics, and instead they will reside upon their colossal, polluted forge worlds, churning out a near-endless stream of technological marvels, which once purified will be dispersed to the lords of the Imperium. Some of these forge worlds are highly specialized, where entire continents will have been broken down, and rebuilt into sprawling manufactura, each of which will produce only a single perfected product. But upon Mars, greatest of all forge worlds, we will find many secrets, which are to be known only by the fabricator general himself. The foundries and production complexes here jut outwards, craning into the skies themselves, whereas immense power plants will have been drilled down through to the very heart of the blasted world, leeching off of the boiling molten core of iron beneath them. Most will never be permitted to walk upon the oxide sands of Mars, but today, my dearest friends, we shall take this voyage and learn of the many hidden mysteries to be found across its surface. We will start by looking into its current state, where near every corner of the irradiated planet has been transformed, all for the furtherment of the Martian cultists' enigmatic desires. After, we will investigate the lives of those who dwell within the Red Sands, before finally learning of some of the most mysterious landmarks hidden away from even the eyes of the Tech Priests. But I have spoken enough. And now we must once again don our rad suits and descend past the Iron Ring to investigate the shrouded secrets of Mars. To look out across the landscapes of Mars, we will be met with a truly terrible sight. The tech priests never saw fit to restore the old terraforming efforts of their ancestors, and so there are to be no flowing streams nor fields of grass and instead, it is simply a radioactive wasteland of death. The sweeping deserts, toned to the deep red color of old rust, stretch across the unclaimed wilderness, forming immense imposing dunes, casting down oppressive shadows from the harsh blare of the sun. Though the atmosphere is indeed thin, it still allows for the occasional gales to blow through the deserts, picking up minuscule biting particulates of dark iron to be carried through the winds at such force that they will rapidly erode anything which has been left uncovered. Looking up, you will see that the skies above are in no better state. The distant sun will only appear as a dim, fading light, barely visible through the impossibly dark clouds coating the world. These have been formed not as a natural phenomenon, but as a polluted byproduct of the ceaseless industries that have been churning for the last 10,000 years. All of the smog, dust, smoke and ash sputtered out by the sprawling forge complexes will have coalesced in the upper atmosphere, 
blanketing the world in a dark fog which will likely never end. But even as you stand upon these ancient war-torn sands, there will be little time to hearken these sights as the pervasive rumble of the forge will be truly inescapable. Across the red planet, there will be no landscape which is free from the presence of the gargantuan manufacturums, ever working away to produce the marvelous gifts of the machine god. Towering black spires will stretch out into the clouds, sided by chimneys and vents, sputtering out the aforementioned smog which has come to occlude this world from the light. At their base, sprawling industrial complexes will have been built upon ancient frames, worn down by the constant erosion of the harsh winds. The facade of every building will be adorned with the great symbols of the cult Mechanicus, ranging from mighty iron cogs through to cybernetic skulls, and even of mysterious hitherto unknown statues, possibly representing their own liege of the machine god. Out in the distance, the largest of the Mechanicus structures will be seen, having been built into the partially excavated ruins of the awe-inspiring mountains which once dominated the landscapes. But returning to the manufacturums closer to us, it will be impossible not to feel the blazing heat emanating out from their very walls. The tech priests themselves care not for the scorching temperatures given off by the city-sized foundries, but for one who is unprotected, then the air itself can feel as though it is burning through your weak, fleshy skin. If one was to inhale but a single breath of this hot, scalding air, then they would immediately be hit by the acrid smell of the red planet. It is a truly offensive mix of thick, polluted smokes, poisonous chemical residues, metallic dusts, all topped off with the harsh tinge of ozone and burnt fuel. It would be challenging for someone to stand and breathe in this toxic menagerie for even a single minute without falling into unconsciousness. And for those who live upon Mars, it is truly essential to replace your entire respiratory and olfactory tract with a far stronger cybernetic implant. Even if you do possess a rather advanced rebreather system, you will need to be sure that it is properly secured, as the rumbling vibrations of colossal industrial tools will constantly shake you to your very core. Within some of these forges, interconnected macro hammers and pneumatic pressers, the size of battle tanks will never relent in their constant pounding, making the grounds quake and tremble with each blow. The noise of each hit will be met by an eternal hum, echoed out by the ancient machinery of the Mechanicus, which when combined with the harsh squeaks of conveyor belts and with the clanking turns of a billion cogs, will form an ear-splitting drone, audible at near every location upon Mars. This will only be broken by the whining screech of enlarged saw blades cleaving through thick metal plates. But if one was to listen closely, they might hear a rather sinister sound over this industrial dirge. If perceptive, one may be able to detect the faintest screams of imprisoned humans, crying their last as they are painfully transfigured into a cybernetic servitor, now destined to spend the rest of their lives as a tireless worker, laboring away within one of the many districts of Mars. Moving between the densely erected structures, Lord Halers and sonic emitters will blare out with the binary canticles of the cult Mechanicus, praising the worship of the machine god and condemning those who would stray from the doctrinal teachings to a sentence far worse than death. Out in the wastes, these cries will continue as the endless broadcast booms across the landscape, being emitted by immense gold-skinned zeppelins gracefully swimming through the thick cloud layer. 
With Mars being the birthplace of the cult Mechanicus, some would expect to find cathedrals or monasteries erected from the red sands. But in truth, the tech priests will not venerate the machine god through simple prayer, as instead, the production and proliferation of technology will stand as the highest form of worship. As such, each and every factory, refinery and assembly plant will exist as its own church to the Mechanicum. And in truth, Mars itself now exists as something of an effigy to the machine, having been broken down and rebuilt into the ideals of mechanical perfection. Through the dust, one may see hulking transportation walkers crawling across the distant landscape on great iron legs, carrying only the least essential of contents between the vast hives and forge complexes. The reason I say this is that the supplies which are actually indispensable for the continued production plans will be shuttled across the world through subterranean magnetworks or by high-speed autonomous flyers. Once arriving at their location, they will deposit their materials into the city-sized warehouses and silos, leaving the arduous task of sorting through this mess to the pathetic servitors assigned to this facility. During one's stay upon Mars, it would not be unheard of to spy the shadow of a tech priest darting through a manufacturer to fulfill some esoteric mission, or to simply ensure that each foundry is indeed performing at the expected efficiency. If any factory fell below their production quota, then the tech priest overseer may simply decree for every servitor within to be taken away and repurposed, and within minutes, a new batch of lobotomized victims will be brought in, as the production can never be allowed to cease. As I previously mentioned, whilst the industrial zones do indeed stretch out across the world, they also dive downwards, having been nestled within the very mantle of the Red Planet. Entire continents have been stabilized through the use of arcane technologies to prevent them from shifting, as the tech priests cannot permit even the planet itself from possibly interfering with their constant task of production. If we were to delve down into the gaps between the tectonic plates, we may find sprawling tunnels leading towards city-sized capacitor banks crackling with enough energy to support an entire hive. From their base, a labyrinthine network of cables will snake outwards, connecting to the many nearby foundries to supply them with the unbridled power necessary for them to continue in their function. Further industrial complexes will be found beneath the surface, where they may exploit the geothermal forces of Mars to improve their own efficiency. Some of the deeper forges will utilize the flowing tides of magma for them to smelt the immense quantities of rare metals needed upon the surface. And the artificially formed volcanoes above them will simply exist to be used as great chimneys, venting their polluted smokes out to join with the deathly airs above. The only life we will find down in these molten reservoirs will be of the blind servitors. The harsh, stinging glow of the magma pools is so intense that their eyes will have been burnt out within the first days of their deployment. But even if they are bereft of sight, thanks to their Mechanicus implants, they will never cease in their tireless labor. Supposedly, there are a series of geological stations constructed across Mars, which will stretch out into the skies above to churn the sickly blanket of smog, producing localized storms which have raged on for so long that they are recorded on the maps of Mars as permanent landmarks. If one was lucky and managed to gaze through the oppressive cloud layer, they may be able to see one of the many wonders of the Mechanicus and it would be of the ancient shipyards built within the aptly named Ring of Iron. This is a colossal halo of construction docks built 
to surround the entirety of Mars, and such is its scale that it has eclipsed and covered the Martian moon of Phobos, repurposing the humble rock to be used for the means of production. But much like the red planet itself, the ring will be subdivided into a series of varied industrial zones. Every single product formed on Mars will eventually be shuttled up to the rad scrubbing and purification districts of the ring, as in its current state it will be so riddled with the carcinogenic waste of the sands below that it will be more akin to a biological weapon than anything else. But perhaps, greatest of all upon the Ring of Iron, would be of the colossal construction yards used in the production of the various void crafts of the Imperial Navy. Dotted across its perimeter, we will find not only a series of formidable defense systems, but also the stationed fleet of Terra's own battle fleet Solar. If war was to ever fall upon the Sol system once more, then this armada would be quick to spread out through the local region, locking down the birthplace of humanity to be safe from the horrors of the stars. Despite all which I have said, and despite the clearly inhospitable nature of this world, we must admit that there is life on Mars. Make no mistake, however, for the flora and fauna brought over by the early colonists are long since extinct. And now, the only ones who remain are those who have rejected the weakness of flesh and embraced the strength and certainty of steel. We can broadly split the populace into four distinct categories. The ruling tech priests, the armies of the Skitari, the unmodified humans and of the pathetic dregs of life found in the servitors. It has been estimated that around 20 billion people now call Mars as their home. But only the tech priests themselves will know as to whether or not this is true, and of how this population is divided between the aforementioned groups. Those who are born beneath the shadow of the machine are not to find themselves with a free life, and instead they live to serve the devotees of the cult Mechanicus, following every request and demand of the tech priests to the absolute letter. In their first moments, a child will be analyzed and quantified by a biologist tech priest, with every single notable aspect of the youngling being recorded within the vast population data banks. Further to this, the genitors will survey the innate potential of the child, and from their results, their future role within the Society of Mars will have been invariably sealed forever. The reason I say this is because the tech priests only require humans who may one day serve the eternal machine. And so, even at the moment of birth, the child will be assigned with a future duty to be performed once they reach adolescence. Some will go on to join the Skitari legions of Mars, whereas others may be deemed as worthy enough to rise as a tech priest themselves, though they will have to earn this most sacred gift through a fervent life of devotion. Many, however, will grow to be laborers within the relatively safer of factories, and although there will be some degree of rad scrubbing equipment within their walls, the workers will still require thick layers of protective equipment, otherwise they will surely fall victim to the oppressive, polluted airs. These three professions will only be suitable for the most able-bodied of humans, but for those who are unable to perform their duties, then they will be forced to meet with a far darker fate. If one cannot efficiently carry out their assigned role, then the tech priests will see this as a problem most dire, yet they will be more than willing to provide a pragmatic solution. The incapable and infirm populace will be stolen away, plucked straight from the production lines, only to be taken to the darkest of chambers where one will be transformed into a servitor. Their brains will be cut away, leaving only the most vestigial remains of a mind, which itself will be shackled by crude neural implants, 
forcing them to be forever dependent on the directives of the priests. Now, eternally loyal, their pathetic appendages will be cut away, replaced with cumbersome, specialized iron limbs, fitted with hefty tools to be used within the harshest of subterranean forges. They will be left no longer as a human, but as an expendable cybernetic worker, cursed to now spend the rest of their thoughtless life within the dark bowels of Mars. Even as a servitor, when they inevitably expire, the priests will simply cut away the remaining decrepit flesh, throwing it into the vast incinerators, so that even in death, their feeble bodies may indeed serve the machine. But to return to the working, able-bodied human populace, they will be permitted to live within the lowest levels of the sprawling hive cities, from where they will always be close to their assigned factories. These have been constructed in a manner which favors the goals and directives of the tech priest masters. And so they are far from comfortable. The cramped living quarters will be dotted with small bunk beds and in truth, it is incredibly rare for one to have their own bedroom instead, being forced to sleep within overpopulated barracks, sometimes containing several hundred of the wheezing, exhausted workers. All food will be imported from distant agri-worlds. And since the tech priests only care for meeting the most basic of nutritional needs, these foods will primarily be found in the form of flavorless pastes dispensed at regular times to the starving masses. When these poor Martians are off the clock, and free from their duties within a factory, then they may wander about the assigned worker zones of their hive. But even this can be a most dire adventure. The labyrinthine walkways, stairwells and corridors stretch out for hundreds of miles in every direction, and one can easily become lost as they aimlessly stumble through the rusted city. Many of these will be bereft of light or proper signage as the tech priests themselves each hold internalized maps of Mars. But if a human has somehow stumbled down a wrong path, then it is incredibly rare for them to ever make it back to safety. Self-locking doors will slam down, sealing the wayward soul in a long forgotten partition. And as they amble deeper and further down, it is almost certain that they will fall and starve never again to be seen by their families. But the lives of baseline humans was always to be put second when compared to the faithful cybernetic adherence to the cult Mechanicus. The tech priests of Mars have earned a very different and far superior life to the common dregs of humanity, and so they will be granted with their own personal chambers within the towering spires of the hive. But even these will be a far cry from what we would consider as a home. There is to be no shred of conventional warmth, nor comfort within their sterile enclosures, as they have been built not for comfort, but for function. The cold steel walls will be adorned with effigies and symbols of devotion towards the machine god, interspaced by thick, snaking cables, connecting the various pieces of arcane machinery to a central workbench, where the priest may work on some of their own personal projects. Above, glowing cogitators and screens will flicker with a constant stream of binary, scrolling so fast that it is almost imperceivable to the human eye. But the Technophant will be silently absorbing everything they see, ordering and categorizing the enigmatic signals sent from their superiors. The sickly lights given off by these screens only illuminate the chamber in a rather dim, ghastly hue, reflecting off of the spilt oil and iridescent alloys splayed about on the workbench. Most priests will own several servo skulls darting about the room to interact with the exposed circuitry, channeling the hive's data to be interpreted by their master. 
As they glide through the air, they will leave a trail in the ever-present smokes, given off by the pungent incense, burning away as a method of tempering the submissive machine spirits to be found throughout the chamber. Many tech priests will have augmented their own brains to free them of the need to regularly sleep, but as with all living beings, some time of rest will still be a welcome reprieve, and so we may still find a small simple bed left in a dilapidated corner. Though they may only retreat to slumber once every few weeks, even their idea of sleep is rather different from what would be considered as normal they will fall into a semi-conscious state, partially to meditate on the teachings of the cult mechanicus, whilst the hovering servo skulls descend to assess and perform maintenance tasks upon any portions of their body which have become damaged. But once they have awoken, then their mysterious duties can begin. Rousing from slumber, there will be no grogginess, as through their mechanical implants, they will be instantly alert and fully prepared to assess the massive amounts of data received during their rest. But before leaving, they will perform their morning rituals comprising of a complete self-diagnosis and by chanting several canticles of the machine god, purifying their cybernetic form to be prepared for the coming tasks. Striding through the serpentine networks of corridors and maintenance shafts, they will reach their destination with an uncanny speed, often emerging from a dark corner of a room through a passageway known only to the true members of the cult. Depending on the nature of the tech priest, their duties can take many different forms. Some will appear within the hellish furnaces, directing the lumbering hordes of servitors to more efficiently carry out their appointed task. Others, however, will enter the sacred halls of the temples to the machine god, where they will spend many ceaseless days toiling away over pieces of arcane technology recovered by explorators during a distant excursion. Not all forge worlds will share their discoveries with the priests of Mars, preferring to keep some secrets to themselves. But even with these dissenters, there will still be a constant stream of curious artifacts flowing down to the Red Planet at all times. During this process, a tech priest may choose to connect themselves directly with the cogitators and computer banks, freeing themselves from their body to interface with the data streams directly. Whilst this undoubtedly speeds up their work, it can be quite painful for one to form such an intimate communion with the machine. But this pain is irrelevant and it must simply be ignored as a slight hindrance in their sacred task of discovery. This will continue day after day until the priest once more retreats back to their dark pungent chambers to purify themselves and fall into that restless half slumber there are millions of tech priests to be found upon Mars, each toiling away in their reverence towards the machine god. But we must now ask ourselves an important question. If the priests, in their lofty position, afford themselves with almost nothing in the way of comfort or luxury, then what sort of life do they provide to the servitors? The similarities between the life of a servitor and of a tech priest start and end at the point that they both reside upon Mars, but beyond this, the two simply have nothing in common. The priests will regard the lumbering masses with the same sense of disgust at seeing a decrepit, dying rat. And yet these pathetic dregs, barely to be considered as alive, serve a most vital duty upon the Red Planet. The day of a servitor will begin, not in a bed, nor beneath the warm light of the rising sun, but instead within the darkness of a storage facility. These are more akin to tombs over anything else, with thousands of servitors being crushed and forced into the suffocatingly tight alcove. 
None would consider these rooms as vitally important, and the tech priests will be more than happy to leave them languishing in squalid misery. Within, the walls themselves will have rusted away, revealing sharp metal supports jutting out to bite into the decrepit flesh of those who were unfortunate enough to be pushed against them. Some of the cyborg workers will have fallen, slipping on the weeping pools of oil, only to be crushed to death by those who piled in on top. There can be no true rest within a room such as this. The air is thick with the smell of unwashed flesh and of rusted, unkept steel. But this matters not to the servitors, who have been robbed of the ability to even perceive their own terrible surroundings. A servitor can only exist in two states. Either they will be engaged in their thoughtless labors, or they will slumber in a restless hibernation. It would be pointless to grant these lobotomized technological zombies with any form of free time. And so, when the allotted work shift is over, the tech priests will simply order them to return to these storage facilities before shutting down their vestigial neural implants forcing them into the darkness of artificial stasis. Whilst in their state of false sleep, they will be connected by ancient cables and clamps, locking them in place until the tech priests ordain for their release back into the forges of Mars. During the night, if one were to listen to the sounds within this room, I do believe that it would be nothing short of horrifying. The eerie sound of a thousand lobotomized workers breathing in heavy, labored unison will only be broken by the dripping sounds of oil leaking out of the ancient machinery above them. The room itself would be pitch black, as there is no need to illuminate such horrors. But through the night, the frozen souls may be exposed to the light by the flashing arcs of electricity, jumping across the loose, exposed wires drooping out of the walls. But suddenly, this nightmarish coma will end. A single megaphone bolted to the ceiling will erupt in a booming canticle of awakening, spurring the lobotomized masses back into the realm of the living. Their dead, sunken eyes will flicker as the metal clamps release them from imprisonment, prompting many to flail out only to collide with one another in dull, pathetic blows. The sounds of creaking limbs and groaning souls will rise in volume, eventually drowning out even the roaring call of the megaphone. But even here, they are unawares of their own pain. There is no thought behind their eyes, no desires, no memories, only an ominous void. As the great chamber door rises with a cacophonous screech, the servitors will spill outwards, tumbling and falling to the grounds, only to stand themselves up, to be met with the uncaring gaze of a tech priest. This technophant will herd the masses, roaring out cries of binary to direct the wayward cyborgs, until at long last, they emerge within the confines of a forge. Here, they will find their appointed places, and the workday can begin with earnest. They are not aware of their duties, nor of their limbs even moving, but they will be forced to toil away within the abyssal depths of these colossal workplaces until the ruling tech priest decrees that their production quota has been met. But during the long workday, through the cacophonous dirge of the Roaring Forge and of the sound of clanging metals, we may hear the faint yet familiar sound of a scream. It is an incredibly common occurrence for a servitor to die during their shift, either because they stumbled and were crushed by an errant piece of machinery, or because their aged, wretched flesh at long last gave out, finally freeing them from servitude and gracing them with the peaceful slumber of death. But upon Mars, even the fallen must provide some benefit to the Great Forge. The crumpled corpses will be promptly dragged away 
and taken to great reclamation chambers in which we will find a sickening pile of the dead. They have been heaped here, being left to fester, but eventually swarms of servo skulls will descend, picking through the bodies to retrieve the precious cybernetics, which can simply be cleaned up and affixed onto the next generation of servitors. The remaining dregs of flesh will be picked clean from the implants, eventually to be tossed into the roaring flames of a forge, with not a thought to be given to the human who died in their service to Mars. For those who survived their shift, they will be rounded up and marched back to their dark chambers in eerie silence. The humans who are unlucky enough to see a lumbering troop of servitors always turn their heads to look away, for they can never be too sure if one of them is a departed relative whose own body was repurposed to serve. Though the tech priests will maintain a constant vigil on the cybernetic workers, on some rare occasions, a servitor will actually break free from their pack, and if not caught in time, then they may even escape into the oxide deserts of Mars. Make no mistake, however, for they are not doing this out of a desire to be free, as they are still lobotomized victims of the Mechanicus, who know not of what they are doing, nor of where they are going. Out in the wastes, they will still attempt to carry out their duties, lumbering from dune to dune in the expectation of returning to a factory, but instead, all they will find is sand. As time passes and as their neural circuits degrade, some will find the shackles on their mind loosening ever so slightly. But due to the invasive surgeries performed upon their brains, they will never again regain their memories, nor be restored to the vibrant individual they once were. As they amble and lope about in a terrified state of madness, some of these semi-autonomous servitors will become erratic, falling upon those who have become lost to the deserts, cannibalizing on their sun-baked flesh as their only means to survive. Others, however, will band together to form wandering packs, destined to blindly stumble through the rusted badlands until they finally expire and fall to be lost beneath the sands. Patrolling Skitari Iron Striders will silently stalk through the dunes, ever hunting for these wayward deviants, but such are their number that it would be simply impossible to catch them all. There are many hushed rumors across the world of Mars that beneath the ancient hive cities and forges, we will find long forgotten Mechanicus structures built into the very foundations of the Martian industrial sprawl. Though they have been left to languish in rusty desolation, they are anything but abandoned. A countless number of these aberrant servitors have come to infest the old foundries, mindlessly leeching off of the still functioning power cables for warmth. It is said that the tech priests have sent thousands of expeditions down into these ruins, seeking to reactivate them. But not a single one of the search parties has ever returned, likely having fallen victim to the starved masses of these cyborg horrors. Perhaps the most famous landmark upon Mars would be of the Grand Mountain, named as Olympus Mons. Over the long millennia, it has been partially excavated, with the ancient rocks being repurposed to act as the foundation to the greatest of forged temples to be found throughout the galaxy, where within untold thousands of tech priests toil away in their constant service to the machine god. But beyond these lesser followers, it is headed by one who many would consider as the most mysterious and enigmatic of the Martian cultists, and this would be none other than the Arch Magos Dominus, Belisarius Call. Architect of the Primaris Marines and Forge Master of Mars, he is seen by many as one who has strayed into the realm of tech heresy. And yet, whatever you may believe of his methods, through this innovation, 
he has invariably changed the face of the 41st millennium. The headquarters of the Legio Titanica is also present upon the sands of Mars, and since the followers of the cult Mechanicus have come to venerate the god engines as being some of the most divine, and revered of gifts from the machine god, many tech priests will take pilgrimages to see one of these titans with their own eyes. Along with their high command, the Red Planet is also the home to the titans of Legio Ignatum, with each of the god engines having been constructed by the Technophants using the sacred Mars pattern blueprint as their basis. Before the Imperium was torn apart by the chaos of the Horus heresy, both Legio Tempestus and Legio Mortis also had their own fortresses upon Mars. The former, however, was forced to relocate to the world of Orestes after a portion of this legion fell to the sway of the traitors, whereas the latter was entirely consumed by chaos, and they now call the hellish eye of terror as their home. If one were to look over ancient astronomical records, they would see that for the vast majority of Martian history that the red planet was orbited by two moons, Deimos and Phobos. However, as it so stands in the 41st millennium, only Phobos remains. It no longer possesses a free orbit, as it has instead been shackled and absorbed as a foundational component within the Ring of Iron. The tech priests have repurposed this moon, transforming it into a defensive battery beyond compare, with great macro cannons and missile silos sticking out across the surface. Deimos, however, has long departed from the orbit of Mars. It was during the lamentable days of the Horus heresy that this moon was stolen away. Using an ancient, long-forgotten technology, Malkador the Sigilite seized the rock of Deimos, transporting it to find its new home around the Saturnian moon of Titan. Here, it now exists as the personal forge world for the mysterious Grey Knights, and such is the degree of secrecy required for their role that it is rumored that the tech priests of Deimos have never once shared any of their discoveries with the Technophants of Mars. But to return to the Red Sands, there are two forbidden regions where none but the most highly esteemed or heretical of tech priests will ever be permitted to walk. The first would be the subterranean vaults of Moravec. During the ancient history of Mars, the so-called Brotherhood of Singularitarianism believed that one day our species would reach a technological singularity in the form of an artificial intelligence whose own abilities far eclipsed our own. The founder of this cult, a man named as Moravec, began his movement upon terror, but the techno-barbarians of the time rejected his word, branding him as a witch, forcing him to flee to the red sands of Mars. Here, he found new aspirants, eager to join in his mission of bringing about the prophesied end of technology, and by his order, they constructed the great vaults, storing away any secrets which may pertain to their goal. Rumor has it that the artifacts contained within the repository were tainted by the touch of the warp, as Moravec had indeed consorted with demonic entities who promised him aid in his fateful mission. Years later, this vault was discovered by the Emperor on his first journey to Mars, where he stated that in order to unite the two worlds under the Treaty of Olympus, that the tech priests were to never again explore its contents, lest its heretical taint spread through their kind. Though this was reluctantly agreed to, during the later Horus heresy, Kelbor Hal, the traitorous fabricator general of Mars did indeed venture into the vaults, unleashing the warp-stained code across the red planet, forming the foundations of the Dark Mechanicum. We do not know as to whether or not this tainted repository was destroyed during the reconquest of Mars. 
But if it does still exist out in the wastes, then to explore even its outer gateway would be a clear admittance of falling into the reviled field of tech heresy. The second forbidden zone is to be found in the mysterious region known as the Noctis Labyrinth. The land here has been scarred and racked to produce a maze-like system of cavernous tunnels connecting the sprawling canyons and steep valleys likely formed eons ago by the raging volcanic activity of the Tharsis region. The Martians have never been able to build any form of structure around its border, as each forge complex would succumb to an unknown technological plague, rendering them as useless. The ruling tech priests have claimed that the deepest mines of the labyrinth were contaminated in a bygone age, and that any creature, whether built of flesh or metal, will fall to their deaths from its presence. But this is simply a myth to dissuade the Martians from ever exploring its expanse. In truth, if one were to venture in, plummeting down to the deepest crevice, they will find a great tomb, and inside sleeps an imprisoned shard of the Void Dragon. Legends say that the Emperor defeated this Catan shard in his ancient past, inspiring the Terran natives to write the fable of St. George and the Dragon. But this felled beast was not to remain upon the soils of Earth. Instead, the Emperor took up the crippled dragon and sealed it away within the Noctis Labyrinth, leaving it to slumber upon Mars for the rest of time. Some have speculated that it is from the pervasive influence of the Void Dragon that pushed the early Martians into developing their fascination for technology, but I believe that this will forever remain as a shrouded myth. The Martians themselves have no idea that a great shard of the Catan slumbers beneath them. However, as time goes on, they have grown ever more suspicious of that which lurks within the labyrinth, as it has seemingly attracted an incursion of the Necrons to land upon their sands. It is doubtful that they will ever explore the cavernous depths, as their own stories seem to be enough to keep them away. But only time will tell if they are to one day send an expedition and finally discover the slumbering dragon of Mars. No forge world of the galaxy can possibly be compared to Mars in its strength and significance. The industrial sprawl, shrouded beneath the fumes of a billion factories, continues to produce some of the finest of materials across the Imperium, and none would turn down the opportunity to learn of the many secrets to be found beneath the red sand. Every member of the Cult Mechanicus will one day turn their attention towards Mars in the hopes that one day they will make their pilgrimage and bask in the glory of the Almighty Machine. The tech priests of this world would never wish to leave, but for the humans, they live a life which is nothing short of horrifying. My dearest friends, this shall now bring us to our end. Thank you for joining me on this journey across the rusted dunes of Mars and for listening to this tale in its entirety. For now, however, as I once again close this chapter on the 41st millennium, I must bid each and every one of you a fond goodbye. Okay. Hello again, everyone. Uh, once more, just before we close this one out, I want to share the work of the talented artist Servo Printer. He's been creating a series of high quality waterproof stickers, each with a unique and custom design for one of the 18 Space Marine Legions, or of the Custodes, the Grey Knights, and of their bolters. And if you want, you can get these coated in a matte or a holographic finish. So these have been carefully produced by hand, being designed and put together by an artist who has been passionately involved in the hobby for over 15 years. And for those of you who are interested in purchasing these stickers, if you use the code SCHOLAR on his Etsy page, where the link is in the description, you'll get a 10% discount on your order. And anyway, once again, thank you all for listening, and take care. <laughs>